So hello and welcome to today's India Institute seminar. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you. I'm Professor Louise Tillin, the director of the King's India Institute. Um, and today marks the beginning of a mini series of seminars within the main India Institute seminar series, um, which we are co-hosting with Professor Ananya Kabir, um, Professor of English Literature at King's and Dr. Luca Raimondi, who has just rejoined King's um, as a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow. This mini series uh, look, is entitled India's Archipelagic Imaginaries um, and looks at India and the Indian Ocean world in the early post-colonial period. Um, and the series curated by, uh, by Luca um, seg segments within um, his uh, new Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship. So we're really delighted to be launching this series today and, and welcome you all um, to what I'm sure will be a very interesting um, seminar on the Andaman Islands. Um, I'm going to hand over to Luca, who will chair today's session and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for welcoming us today and for giving us the opportunity to organize this uh, thematic sub-series. Uh, we really appreciate your hospitality um, and are also thrilled to be part of uh, you know, a lineup of events uh, uh, that the King's India Institute is offering this year. Um, um, before introducing the seminar today and Shazia, uh, our speaker, um, I just want to provide just a couple of minutes I will, I will take uh, of, of context um, um, around the organization of this mini series uh, on uh, archipelagic Indias. Uh, the context, as Louise anticipated, is that of my uh, research project, um, the Marie Curie project that I'm working on with um, Professor Ananya Kabir as my supervisor here in the English department uh, at King's. Um, and for my project, I am uh, looking at uh, how a group of Indian writers and intellectuals in the first roughly two, three decades after the independence of India, inhabited the Indian Ocean region as um, um, a social, as an effective space, a uh, space that was marked by personal and family relations, by individual and by collective memories. Um, but, but also how this region then functioned um, for them, uh, both as a conceptual geography uh, one that informed or sometimes clashed with the um, cultural politics of the time and as a, a, a space of and for also literary imagination, a, a, an imaginative geography, if you will. Um, and when we started thinking about the project uh, and we tried to retain for it a non-territorial epistemology uh, uh, and uh, an anti-essentialist uh, conception of culture, we, you know, instantly looked um, uh, for our methodological scaffolding at the body of, 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 of theory or philosophical works on um, archipelagic thinking uh, that originates uh, from the Caribbean. Um, you know, um, archipelagic theory usually is is thought to be mostly produced by, it is actually by Caribbean writers and thinkers uh, in many languages, such as, for example, Edouard Glisson, um, Antonio Benitez Rojo, um, Kamal Brathwaite, and also by more recent scholars uh, working on the Caribbean themselves. Uh, but, you know, this very elementary recognition that that is that was also the go to area for our body of, of knowledge. Um, and, you know, the recognition that, of course, a translational act was required for, for using this body of knowledge in the context of my of, of our research project alerted us more and more to the importance of of learning from the experience, from the stories and possibly also, you know, from the notions that originate from other archipelagic spaces, such as the one that exists in the Indian Ocean, or specifically the ones in the Indian Ocean and in or around India itself. Um, and this is how we, we, we came uh, to the organization of the seminar series. It's also a way for us to learn from scholars working on these archipelagic spaces. Um, and, um, 
I, I also want to say that this um, seminar series, we conceived it in dialogue with uh, a publication project, an ongoing publication project, um, um, which um, is curated by uh, Professor Kabir and um, her collaborator, Ari Gauthier, um, um, called Letinai Revi. It's a medium publication project, and uh, we published uh, a dossier in August of this year on the Lakshadwi. Um, and we shall be publishing a, another dossier next year on the Andaman Islands. And the Lakshadweep and the Andaman Islands are the two areas that we will also look at for this uh, mini series of seminars. Uh, so today we will start uh, with the Andaman Islands. Um, and the person that will take us there is uh, Dr. Shazia Rahman. Um, Shazia is an associate professor of postcolonial literature. Uh, at the University of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, she has written extensively on issues of feminism, cosmopolitanism, and environmental justice. And in 2019, she published a book for the University of Nebraska Press called Place and Postcolonial Ecofeminism, Pakistani Women's Literary and Cinematic Fictions. Um, Shazia's talk today is titled Fiction and Forgotten Histories of the Andaman Islands. And, um, her talk will be followed by a response uh, by Professor Ananya Kabir. Um, Ananya, I, I'm also introducing Ananya for those who don't know <laughs> her. She's a professor of English at King's College London, as Louise uh, said, and um, um, she's a recipient of the Infosys Prize for the Humanities and the Humboldt Research Fellowship. Uh, she has published extensively and um, um, most recently, and um, most importantly for the i think for the for the um you know uh, for this uh, specific uh, event that we and a seminar series that we are organizing she has uh, co-founded with uh, writer Ari Gauthier uh, the multilingual online cultural platform latina creole uh, which promotes uh, a vision for a plural and creolized india so i will now um, give um Shazia, uh, uh, the opportunity to present um, her uh, paper and her research to us, and then uh, we will follow with the response and the Q and A. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, OK. Can everybody see that? Yes. OK, great. <laughs> so thank you, Luca, for your generous introduction. Um, I really appreciate this invitation to present. I've been uh, enjoying learning about the Andaman Islands. This is a new project for me. Um, and I wanted to share first with you um, its exact location. Um, I don't know how clear this map is, but I hope you can see that the Andaman Islands are actually located in Southeast Asia. So they're right here. This is it. Um, hopefully the colors on this map um, are making it a little bit easier to see that the Andamans are actually an extension of Indonesia. See right there, this is Indonesia. These are the Andamans. Um, and so the archipelago that we're talking about is actually um, the Indonesian archipelago. And in fact, the Andamans are closest to Myanmar, which is right there. Um, I bring up location because there are ways in which archipelagos can decenter the way we think. So for instance, in a way, the Andaman Islands, which are currently part of the nation state of India, they decenter land-based India because they expand the idea of India beyond this South Asian landmass over here. Um, in so doing, they unsettle center periphery binaries. According to Bill Ashcroft, archipelagos are not simply the other of continents. They challenge the polarity of sea and land, of island and continent, and indeed go so far as to challenge binary thinking itself. To this, I would add that the archipelago of the Andaman Islands destabilizes assumed binaries, binaries not only between sea and land, island and continent, but also the binary that assumes 
the nation is the center while the island is relegated to the periphery. And the reason I bring this up is because I want to talk today about this novel, um, The Miraculous True History of Nomi Ali. This is Usman Khan's Khan's fifth novel, and it's set in the Andaman Islands from a little bit earlier than what Luca was talking about, 1936 to 1947. Uh, during the British colonial rule, as well as Japanese occupation. In this novel, the Ottoman Islands are not relegated to the periphery at all. They are at the center of a really important and forgotten history. Um, the fact that the novel is set before Indian independence pre-1947 decenters the idea of India as a unified national entity with clear-cut borders because its Indian characters are tied to places that would later be identified as Lahore, uh, Pakistan in 1947 and Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh in 1971. This has the effect of expanding the very idea of India beyond its current borders in addition, as readers, we learn about the imperial influence of characters from England and Japan. Uh, in this sense, the novel follows history closely to present us with characters that we know could have lived there at that time. According to Claire Anderson, Madhumita, Mazumdar, and Vishwajit Bandia, because of the presence of a colonial prison, by the 1930s, when the novel is set, the, the people living on the Andaman Islands included indigenous inhabitants, convicts, ex-convicts, convict descendants, uh, the local born, they're called, and various other coerced migrant groups. So the plot of the novel awful, follows um, an unnamed Indian woman political prisoner from Lahore, referred to only as 218D, who arrives on South Andaman Island in 1936 as the novel begins. Her mistreatment in the colonial prison attracts the attention of a Burmese uh, local born boy, I, whose great grandfather was deported to South Andaman Island in 1858. I asks the indigenous Andamanese Loka to help the female prisoner escape the British jail. Eventually, he and the rest of the local borns discover that, in fact, the Japanese occupation is no better than British colonialism. Um, and as World War II rages on around them, all the characters have to figure out how to live. Um, the two main characters who survive the violent events of the novel are Indian Nomi Ali and Burmese Ai. So what's really interesting about their survival is that it clearly has something to do with their ability to listen. In fact, the final words of the novel describe both as listening. Together they watch, they listen, end quote. And what they listen to are the islands themselves, which can be heard by a number of characters in the novel. In the case of I, even when the island is silent for some time, um, this is a quote from the novel, for the first time since the war began, the island had spoken to him again. Uh, Nomi tells I that she can even, quote, hear the islands breathe, end quote. In this way, their resilience, their ability to survive is the result of their openness to the islands, their voices, and their winds. And I bring up winds because in addition to the human characters in this novel, we also have non-human characters who are winds that speak for the islands. They can be heard by indigenous characters like Loka and also non-indigenous characters like I. When the winds speak for the islands, they say very specific things about resisting the British and the Japanese and protecting human and non-human beings. In addition, the novel's use of winds includes Andamanese no Indi indigenous notions of time that connect the past with the present and future. So in my reading of the miraculous true history of Nomi Ali, I argue that it presents a version of archipelagic thinking grounded in indigenous knowledge and perceptions of time. The novel illustrates this way of thinking through winds, which are non-human characters who speak to human indigenous and non-indigenous characters alike. 
since the narrator always presents the wind's words as the islands, I call this knowledge archipelagic because it comes from the islands. Just as Nomi and I learn to listen to this archipelagic perspective, I argue that we can all learn from what the winds tell us, especially those of us who are interested in island studies. So the need to rethink dominant perceptions of time has become particularly pressing owing to our current climate crisis. According to Steph Krabs, quote, the sheer quantity of memory research that has been done since the 1980s has given rise to a fear that our apparent fixation on memory has become disabling in the sense of diverting our attention away from the need to face the future, end quote. However, Usma Aslam Khan's careful attention to place helps us remember a forgotten history in order to draw connections with both our present and our future. The novel depicts indigenous Andamanese characters such as Loka and Lulu, whose worldviews and language are surprisingly similar to what the Ongi, a particularly vulnerable tribal group of the Andaman Islands, uh, described to anthropologist Vishwaji Bandia during his fieldwork there. In their discussions with Bandia, they reveal how they conceptualize history. Bandia explains both past and future are apprehended within the present. And this experience of time is described as Drodekwata. The past is seen as an experience that has gone by like the winds, not as something left behind for good any more than the winds leave the island permanently, end quote. And while the term Drodekwata never appears in the novel, winds are influential characters who speak to humans and guide them in ways that protect non-humans resist both British and Japanese imperialism and are beneficial for the future. Thus, in the novel, the winds help apprehend an archipelagic thinking grounded in the Andamanese concept of Dodequata that does not section off the past and future from the present and instead helps characters and readers understand intersections that help move away from what Mark Rifkin calls settler time. In his important book, Beyond Settler Time, Rifkin articulates, quote, indigenous peoples and peoples, uh, means of envisioning futurity through connections across time and with non-human entities, end quote. So while Rifkin's focus is North America, his inclusion of all indigenous peoples in his theorizing makes it possible to see Dortequata as similarly collapsing past and future in the present while attending to non-human entities in ways that are beneficial for all. The novel implies that resisting imperialism is archipelagic because the island tells I to resist the Japanese through winds and winds themselves uh, resist the British. In thinking about uh, utopianism in Caribbean literature, Bill Ashcroft uh, explores how, arca, this is a quote, how archipelagic thinking is directed towards the future and how it generates hope rather than simple opposition, end quote. So I argue that the miraculous true history of Nomi Ali provides a blueprint for archipelagic thinking that generates hope by connecting cultural memory and history to both our present and our future. And part of the way the novel gets this idea across is by emphasizing that we should listen to islands. So in what follows, I'm gonna discuss the Andamanese indigenous concept of Totequata in relation to the representation of the winds of the Andaman Islands in the novel and their significance for archipelagic thinking as we face our future of ongoing imperialism and climate change together. In writing about the voice of Caribbean and Pacific writers, Elizabeth de Lugri reminds us that, quote, working within the Western power structures which prioritize size, might, military and technological power, the island voice is often cartographically diminished to the supposed insignificance of its very landscape. Small size becomes a metonymy for the lack of history, end quote. 
However, Han does not diminish the island voice at all through the most important events that occur in the novel, which involve what the winds do and the island speaking to I. Um, the reader hears the, the winds emphasize the importance of resisting both British and Japanese imperialism and protecting both human and non-human beings. This more than anything else is what the island says through the winds. In her acknowledgments at the end of her novel, Uzma Aslam Khan lists the sources to which her book is indebted. For details about the islands, she lists Vishwajit Bandia's In the Forest, which came out in 2009, which is the result of Bandia's decades long anthropological fieldwork on the islands, as well as Madhushri's Mukherjee's The Land of Naked People, which is based on seven years of research. Khan's descriptions of Loka closely match Mukherjee's descriptions of the great Anamanese, while Han's representations of Lulu match Bandia's portrayal of the Ongi, even though the novel simply states that they are from different indigenous tribes living on different islands. The clearest evidence that these characters are based on the people Mukherjee and Bandia met is that of language, since many of the words used by Loka and Lulu in the novel are the same words Bandia lists in his book. For example, the words Kugelge, ku, sorry, Kugebe War and Lohaye Iron appear in the novel when the female prisoner from Lahore escapes from her cell with Loka's help and goes to live with Lula's pe Lulu's people on another island. So here, uh, Lulu's son Lala Ram, who is descended from another escaped Indian convict, speaks multiple languages and uses these words to speak to the prisoner. When she asks what's going on, he responds, uh, quote, Kugebe, war. Uh, Lala Ram goes, continues to try to teach the prisoner his language. And he says, Lohaye, uh, touching first the arrowhead and then her hand, end quote. So these linguistic similarities between the Ongi that Bandia lives with and the characters in Han's novel invite a reading of the novel through Andamanese indigenous knowledge. All the winds represented in the novel are crucially important given the fact that Han draws inspiration from Bandia's interviews and fieldwork. Since winds are non-human, it comes as no surprise that Khan has included them as characters. In fact, one of the most compelling aspects of Uzma Aslam Khan's fiction is her inclusion of non-human characters. When the island speaks to I, it speaks through winds. I names all the winds he hears, um, and Loka also names, uh, he has names for the winds that he hears, and Lulu actually uses the names that the Ongi use, according to Bandia. So it's like the same names. The, the non-human characters we meet are female winds who protect a pregnant pig from two British officers and their two Indian employees who come to their island during the Japanese occupation in 1943. Their goal is to retake the Andamans from the Japanese, but the three winds send them away. Even though the two Indians were both forest workers who knew the islands well, they did not, quote, hear the winds, end quote, the way I, Luca, uh, sorry, Lo Loka, and Lulu are all able to. So winds are portrayed as intradigetic characters whose genealogy can be traced. Uh, quote, the northeast wind, my Akangne woke up her quick-tempered sister, the southwest wind, Kualakangne, together they woke up their mother, end quote. This is from the novel. When the British officers ask the Indians to shoot the pregnant pig, the winds protect her and then, quote, get rid of the men. As the four men leave, it's clear that these winds have an agenda that resists British imperialism and protects non-human beings. Since the winds in this novel speak for the islands, their agenda and their actions can be considered archipelagic. In addition, these three winds' names are those used by Lulu's tribe who are based on the Ongi. We know this because when the prisoner from Lahore first goes to live with them uh, and the storm would seize her, the children in the novel call her Kualakane. This is their name for the quick-tempered Southwest wind. According to Bandia, the Ongi use myths to explain their history and their future, quote, the very changes of weather are explained by the winds that blow from beyond and on which the spirits ride, 
So by describing three winds as female characters in the novel, Han implies that these are three of the spirits of the island for Lulu's tribe. Thus, I argue that in the novel, listening to the winds, regardless of their names, is listening to the island spirits who speak for the islands. Like Lulu's tribe, the Burmese character I also has a long catalog of winds that he listens to. Quote, he had names for each wind, and one day he would teach Nomi, the yellow angel, the praying mantis, the father, the friend, end quote. The, the wind he calls the father is a cold wind. His own father is also cold and distant because the British experimented on him as they tested drugs such as uh, quinine on convicts on the island. And according to Barnavedic, um, experiments for treating leprosy with gurgin oil and quinine for a malaria were conducted on the convicts at that time. So as a result, Ai's father is silent, aside from muttering as he sits on his rock, while Ai's mother and grandfather actually raise him. So on the night when the Japanese decide to round up and drown hundreds of villagers, the father wind visits Ai, one of very few swimmers on the island. Quote, something was happening tonight, the wind said, the roundups, whatever they were, they had only just begun. Hunger wanted him to drift into a slow end without memory, but the wind wanted him awake. The two forces waged a war inside him, end quote. The island, which speaks to I through the winds, is waging a war to awaken I rather than allow him to forget the history of imperialism as well as his personal history and memories. Hunger and bodily needs keep him from resisting, but the island has other plans. Just as the female winds resist the British and protect the pig, here the father wind exhorts I to resist the Japanese and protect the local borns. The novel implies that listening to the winds who speak for the islands can give us strength. The father wind, quote, had never before given him strength, but tonight it was attempting to do just this. The wind began to take shape, the shape of his father before the pharmaceutical experiments, when he had been able to distinguish between rain and shine, between soiled clothes and fresh, when he had laughed and loved. This wind that was taking shape, it was standing up with feet that were very fine. I too must stand up, end quote. The cold wind that I calls the father wind actually becomes the spirit of his father to help him remember the violence of British and Japanese imperialism. It reminds him that he can help. I was a healer. There were people who needed him. Stand up, said the father wind, rising now to its full height, dwarfing the rock on which it had once sat. Stand up and receive this world again, end quote. The island speaking as a wind in the shape of his father convinces I to join the people entering the boats from which the Japanese will push them into the ocean. I's presence and ability to swim help him save Nomi's mother, all because the island spoke to him through the father wind. So this is a crucial moment of epiphany in the novel because until this moment, I, who would not all, who, who had always listened to the wind felt that his, that his choices were the wrong ones, that listening to the winds did not lead him to making the right decisions. Specifically, I regrets choosing to help Wilka retrieve the skull of his sister's dead husband from his British employer. Bondi explains that one of the primary occupations of Ongi hunter gatherers is to manufacture, quote, talismanic items like amulets made of human bone. And even uh, Bandia even provides a photo of an Andamanese woman with her dead husband's skull. Um, so in the novel, Loka tells I that if he helps him get the skull, then Loka will do any one thing that I asks of him. I decides to help Loka, and in return, he asks Loka to facilitate the prisoner's escape from jail. This decision makes it impossible for I to assist his best friend, Z, Nomi's brother, who later ends up dying at the hands of the Japanese. Quote, it seemed to be the way of the island that whenever there were only two sides, neither was right, end quote. However, when the island speaks to him through the father wind, he's finally told that in listening to the island, he has been making the right decisions, the right choices. 
The island tells him that he had been right that day he took, this is a quote, he had been right that day he took the skull. His hands were able to link people and they still held this power. I had done right by Loka and the prisoner. He would soon see he would do right again, end quote. The island's words here come to eye through the wind and the significance of these words lies in the emphasis on linking people. According to Otmar Et, the quote island metaphor leaves room for at least two interpretations. It can be as symbol of one's remote seclusion on the one hand and of one's keen awareness of many sided relation with others. In fact, an archipelago communicates with other regions, end quote. In this way, archipelagic thought is connected to linking, and here it links indigenous people with others, like I. Moreover, the island's words to I are true, because when I chooses to save the prisoner, she goes on to save Nomi and I. After the war, when um, reporters ask I what happened to him and how he survived, he realizes that the island had always been right. Quote, had he helped Z escape from the Japanese instead of helping the prisoner escape from the British, had he been able to reverse their fates the way he had wanted, then I might not be alive and neither would Nomi, for then there would be no prisoner to help them, end quote. I realizes much later that listening to the island through the winds was always the right thing to do. Loka perhaps, because he's indigenous, is much more certain than I in his knowledge of the winds, which he also names and sees as protecting both human and non-human beings. When I helps Loka retrieve the skull, he with I helps the prisoner escape. Quote, um, as they headed for the canoe, Loka said the lightning in the sky was a pearl sent by Biliku, the north wind, to help them move swiftly, and they did, end quote. Loka's understanding of Biliku, the north wind, is reminiscent of what Madhushri Mukherjee learns of the great Andamanese. She writes, the great Andamanese had a number of taboos against taking the lives of creatures, many of which were under the protection of Biliku, the northeastern monsoon wind, end quote. So Han replicates this indigenous knowledge in her novel through the character of Loka, who knows that Biliku is pleased and helping them because she wants to protect non-human beings. He tells I, quote, Biliku brought deadly storms if provoked. If, for instance, she heard her children, spiders and cicadas in distress, spiders could not be killed. Tonight, Biliku was pleased. Tonight, she helped them, end quote. So similarly, Mukherjee writes, in North Andaman, Biliku was supposed to be angered by the killing of a spider, end quote. So unlike I, Loka does not question the messages he gets from the North Wind, Iliku. He knows what is right. I and Nomi understand by the end of the novel that they must listen to the island, but Loka, clearly based on the great Andamanese, already knows this. As readers, we are also invited to think in this archipelagic way. I'm skipping some stuff, so hopefully you'll follow along. Um, when I uses his history to help him navigate the space of the caves of the island, the connection between space and time becomes clear. When I, as a young 12-year-old boy working for Mr. Howard, the British superintendent of the jail, one of I's responsibilities is to collect birds' nests so that Mr. Howard can sell them. The caves he descends into are treacherous, but he uses, this is really interesting, he uses his family's history to ground him, uh, quote, the repetition of dates of a forgotten past, a past not taught at school. He recited them as a prayer before descending into the cave, perhaps to keep from slipping through time. When his great grandfather arrived, 1858, when the jail was built, 1906, when his father lost his mind, 1910, when I was born, 1924. He looked around. The face of the island had never been more illuminated." End quote. So cultural memory grounds I in time as he navigates the space of the island. In addition, the winds, especially the father wind, is with him. Quote, it was too dark to see even his nose, and the air was cold here, the father wind. Now his hands, they could unmap the grooves of time along this ledge and that, 
They had always guided him, end quote. So here, the, the novel invites us to ask how time can be unmapped. The answer to this question comes again from the presence of the wind, which is the island and presents archipelagic thinking linked with the ongi. Unmapping the grooves of time with his hands and aided by the father wind, space changes around I since it's no longer only mapped onto the present time. In his explanation of, ongi, of the ongi idea of history, Bandia links aspects of time with space. Quote, we might describe their perception of history as rhythmic rather than linear. And in their own language, this understanding of history is captured in the term dotequata, which literally translates as, as continued from the past and is used to describe a constant pattern of wind that passes through the island from different directions." End quote. So if history is not linear, the past continues in the present and is constantly with us, just as in the novel, the winds are. As Bandia explains, according to this conception, the winds govern the lives of the Ongi. The metaphoric link between everyday activities and varieties of historical experience must therefore be seen in relation to the winds. The winds always prevail so that all the diversity of experience, all order and disorder are accommodated in this continuity. The consequences of the first colonial encounters remaining starkly evident in the shrinking of the community, it's difficult to visualize a future free of the burden of the past." End quote. So the Ongi are aware that their diminished numbers are a direct result of the colonial encounters of their past. Both their present and their future is affected by this past. Because the winds always prevail, always continue to accommodate all experience, archipelagic thinking shows us that history is not linear and therefore space in the present contains both past and the future. I's past um, family history is with him as he negotiates the space of the cave with the presence of the father wind. Time is unmapped in the Yongi belief system and in the archipelagic thinking put forward by the novel, which accommodates all order and disorder. Bandia's discussions with the Ongi add to our understanding of what archipelagic thinking could be for us if we, like I and Nomi, would only listen. So Uzma Aslam Khan's historical fiction uh, does important cultural work with its setting on the Andaman Islands and its ideas about time and space. As Itzi Abraham writes about the islands today, quote, the multicultural habitus of the Andamans is deeply unsettling from a geopolitical standpoint that imagines the islands as a natural extension of a homogenous national territorial space. However, Han's novel, this is me, Han's novel goes much further than simply presenting a multicultural cast of characters that works against the rigid claims of Indian ethnic nationalism. Khan's emphasis on indigenous knowledge, belief systems, and histories decenters India in an even more radical way. To quote Abraham again, the haunting presence of the indigenous is a constant, if unspoken, reminder that mainland India too is a settler society. In, its civilization was also built on the extermination, suppression, violation, exclusion, and marginalization of the mainland's indigenous people. Reading Khan's novel today while using archipelagic thinking means remembering the British and Japanese occupation simultaneously with present day Indian occupation of indigenous land. In fact, in an interview with Buja Bande, Uzma Aslam Khan insists that the historical fiction she has written is cyclical. Quote, this history is chillingly cyclical and this fiction during each year it took me to write was always of the moment. Part of what makes this novel of the moment today is that as we consider the indigenous knowledge that Han has weaved into her novel, we cannot ignore that present day Indian occupation of indigenous land has led to environmental movements. According to Alok Amatya, the Gond, Halba, Dorla, and Muria Adivasi tribes have been agitating against the government's push to expand the extraction of mineral resources from their homelands. Like the novels Biliku, The North Wind Who Protects the, the Non-Human, Indigenous peoples in India and globally are struggling for environmental justice. As Kyle Powis White so eloquently reminds us, quote, 
Indigenous peoples face climate risks largely because of how colonialism, in conjunction with capitalist economies, shapes the geographic spaces they live in and their socioeconomic conditions. Climate injustice for Indigenous peoples is less about the specter of a new future and more like the experience of deja vu, end quote. Indigenous peoples have been there before. Their lives have been jeopardized over long periods of time because of colonialism and capitalism. Climate injustice is merely the result of these long histories, which we ignore at our peril. Archipelagic thinking in Han's novel relies on indigenous knowledge to meld together a concern for non-human beings and environment with simultaneous resistance to occupation and imperialism. This is what historical fiction can do for all of us. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Shazia. Luka, shall I just launch into my response? Of course, yes, yes, yes thank you very much. I just wanted to thank Shazia. <laughs> thank you, and please, Ananya. Yeah, I just uh, want to leave a little bit of time for our very interesting guests. Uh, I see a lot of names that I we know, you know, have um, have things to say about similar issues, uh, Shazia. So I'm hoping uh, to give a very brief response and, and, and collect some questions and responses from our attendees, um, uh, whom of course we thank for making time uh, for us um, in the middle of their days. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, thank you uh, for that moving reading, um, which took us to the, um, uh, that, you know, even shows us how novelists can use um, even in words, you know, from languages that normally don't enter um, our 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 linguistic domains and uh, we know a few more words now <laughs> thanks to thanks to your readings um so i think uh, on the even how i've been uh, observing how words inserted into novels in whichever language they're you know actually do the archipelagic thing <laughs> by being the islands that we're talking about that otmar Ette talks about uh, both isolating and connecting and I, I find the words like um, that you have cited um, from the from the indigenous languages and you've used, I think, are those are archipelagic in their uh, rhetorical power. Um, and in the process, they really use a, the space of the novel to create that archipelagic episteme that you, uh, you know, that you traced in your reading. Um, and here I find it equally interesting how you have used your specialization, of course, in eco-feminism, eco-criticism to, 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 to draw attention to uh, the non-human actors that um, particularly the winds that uh, play such an important role in this, um, in this uh, novel. And in short then, as you say, to resist imperialism and indeed neo-colonialism in the form of nationalism um, is to be archipelagic. But how do you do that is the next question. And I think um, the, 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 the literary critical maneuvers, you know, I mean, the literary critical reading that you provide us of Uzma's maneuvers, I think help us listening to winds, listening to local languages. Um, and um, finally, I think uh, also returning to the idea of location because ultimately if the idea if, if our if our challenge is to rethink what nationalism can do you know um both positive and negative i think the the ways in which we think from the sea of islands as it were to use the um the phrase used by epeli haufa the pacific islands thinker which then iti abraham uses in that article that you cite towards the end the Andamans as a sea of islands um and i think um that's um the, the rethinking india from the sea of islands i think is 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 what this novel does and what your reading helps us to do but what remains a bit of the elephant in the room which i think is extremely important to also bring out into the discussion is that we are used to thinking about relating India and Pakistan to each other post 1947 through the traumatic legacies of the partition. 
but this novel triangulates it or decenters actually even the our territorial obsessions with the ruptures of partition by taking us to another space the sea of islands because Uzma Aslam Khan is of course is a Pakistani author or origin she's now living in the states but she, and her novels have always been about Pakistan you know and now what does it mean that such an author is writing a novel about the Andamans and about Lahore which was part of British India and of course you yourself are coincidentally or not Pakistani. So, you know, I think this is a really interesting way to re reopen dialogues of, um, of, of old traumas with, uh, with fresh um, approaches. And the approach from the Sea of Islands perhaps is, 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 the, is, the, is where we need to, you know, restart our, our rapprochement uh, from. So thank you very much for that reading. I'm hoping that people have questions or comments um we um luca are you going to try to manage that part um i can't see any yet um but i see a lovely comment already from naiza naiza khan um artist who is from karachi and now lives and works from london um thank you shazia she says that was amazing to consider the geography of land from the archipelagic imagination. Nazia says, uh, sorry, Niza, sorry, Niza. Niza says that she has many questions. Niza, please, we want to hear them. Feel free to maybe mute your, unmute yourself and to ask some questions, Niza, if you will. We are, we are more than happy to accommodate that. Would you like to do that? Um, Ananya, we may just have to check that she's able to unmute herself. I think Vignesh yeah. might have fallen off the call, which I that allowed to talk. I have brilliant. You can do it. Yep. Yes, I have done it. <laughs> Niza. Are Hi. You able... Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Shazia. I've, I've read um, the book Ecofeminism, and it was really um, it was there were so many things I could relate to. Um, I mean, I don't know if I have a question because I, I need to listen to this whole conversation again, but um, I guess more of a comment, just um, what you said in the end about um, decentering the, the state, nationalism, patriarchy, you know, out of its own, like, quite self-centered, you know, self in South Asia with, with all the... Um, contestation of um, territory and um, history um, is, is really interesting. Um, and I think, um, you know, your, your um, reading of Uz, uh, Uzma's book is, uh, you know, just uh, completely um, frames uh, those wider conversations. So I think I'm just uh, kind of like in my mind trying to uh, link uh, these this triangularity that uh, Ananya mentioned, um, which which is really great for my imagination, and I'm sitting in my studio in London, um, you know, cooking up images now. <laughs> but thank you so much. I'm sorry, there's no specific question yet. No, no thank, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Actually, Niza, if I may, the 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 work of yours that I sh uh, saw when you you know at the Venice Biennale, which uh, where you were representing Pakistan at the first ever Pakistan Pavilion for the Biennale, um, there was this, the use of winds, you know, and sound. Uh, uh, Shazia, I don't know if you're aware of this work of uh, Niza's, which both involves cartography. Of course, it's speaking of the coast of. Of, of you know Karachi and Menorah Island, but there is a lot of sonic effects of winds and bird song and the wow. recitation of um, of colonial records of weather which are recorded at the observatory. So you know there's a lot of I think elements there literally, <laughs> um, which, which yeah to the questions that you raise. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Ananya. That, that's fascinating. I actually did not know about that. So thank you for telling me. There's a question from Louise. Um, Louise, do you want to ask it? Um, yeah, happy to, happy to. Um, so Shanzia, you started with this really powerful map, actually, which I found very um, striking to be reminded of the 
just how proximate the, the, the Andamans are to, to Indonesia and to, to Myanmar rather than the Indian mainland. Um, and yet I felt that in some ways, as you spoke, that um, element of, of kind of decentering the Indian nation fell away. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I wondered, you know, is there an extent to which the, the, the novel helps us think about kind of, or to decenter India within the Indian Ocean world by virtue of the connection of these of the islands to these other um, you know, regional or other parts of the region? Well, I, I mean, the, obviously the novel is huge and has a lot of characters. Um, and, you know, I didn't even touch on the comfort women that the Japanese brought in. There's, there's a lot going on in the, in the novel. I thought that when I began by talking about Indonesia and Myanmar and actually looking at the physical location, that that would be, that would be sort of my jumping off point for actually focusing on the Burmese character, I, um, and, and talking about um, him and the indigenous characters. Uh, I, I think that there's, there can be many readings of this novel, but in uh, most of my reading, I'm talking not about the Indian character, who's the titular character, right? Nomi Ali is literally in the title, um, and I'm not really talking about her. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, so to me, the, the novel really, really decenters India, because if you look at it from my reading, it's the Burmese character and the indigenous characters. But even if you look at Nomi Ali, I mean, I think, I think that the, the Indian characters are from what is now Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, uh, I actually cut out a section of this that's about Shakuntala, who's from Chittagong. Um, and so I think that, I think that it, it definitely does decenter India. I'm, I'm sorry that it didn't come out in my presentation as well, but I was trying, that's what I was going for. Do we want to ask uh, Nilofer to ask her question? Thanks uh, for the response, Shazia, and also, of course, to you for the question. Nilofer. Thank you, Ananya. Um, hi, Shazia. It's really nice to hear about your work um, today. It's my first time listening to you. Um, I really enjoyed the talk, but I did come in a little, a uh, few minutes late, so I have apologize if you might have addressed this um, in those first moments. Um, but as you were speaking, um, it really reminded me of what a wonderful time it is to be doing this kind of Indian Ocean work. As somebody who is working on their first book right now, I'm just really glad to have both senior professors and um, colleagues who are, you know, junior scholars writing their first books or writing their dissertations. Um, and your talk really reminded me in particular of um, Shritama Chatterjee's uh, recent MLA talk on archipelagic thinking in the Indian Ocean novel. Um, so I was wondering, um, you know, in, in your larger project, to what degree um, are you scoping out to other um, areas of the Indian Ocean? Like, are you following your text in that regard or like where your methodology is in that? Um, and then also if you see this work that you're doing in the Indian Ocean, archipelagic thinking and eco-critical approaches to it, like vis-a-vis -vis the wind, um, contributing to Caribbean studies where um, conversations about archipelagos are sort of longer going than we've had in, in South Asian literary studies and certainly in Indian Ocean literary studies. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I did mention at the beginning that this is a brand new project for me. <laughs> So um, I have been looking at uh, what's, what's been coming out of the Caribbean, and certainly that is, that is what I hope that what comes out of, um, you know, all the work that we're doing, that that then affects uh, what's going on in the Caribbean as well. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that we all uh, want and do. Uh, but, but it's also, I think, important to look at um, the specifics of certain contexts. I mean, there are things that are happening in the Indian Ocean that are different um, than the Caribbean. And, uh, and, and yeah, so I, I think, yeah, I'm gonna be at the MLA in January. So um, I hope to see you there. And uh, yeah, thank you. I, I hope that answers your question, uh, but thank you. Actually, Sritama was here too. 
but she um, she uh, had to leave early. So uh, maybe she'll you know catch up with you um, back channel as it were. But she was here. Um, there's a question from Rosa and a question from Munir, um, and maybe we'll make these the two last questions because I know that we also you know um, we, 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 we are, we've got this time limit on us. Um, Rosa, would you like to ask your question? I've I've given you the. I put you on the screen. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so my question was about um, essentially your re well the text and your reading of the text and how um, I felt like it uh, kind of gave um, a secondary role to uh, European colonialism and that there were you know other sort of actors in history that came in and that were also kind of oppressive forces um, and I was wondering if that was. Um, you know, part of what the archipelagic, you know, thinking can do. And if also it is somewhat troubling to, you know, maybe have these different, um, these, yeah, these different, you know, negative forces onto, you know, indigenous thinking to be somewhat equal or, you know, to be compared in some ways. Does that make sense? Sorry. Uh, well, Okay, I'll just tell you what I'm hearing you say. What I'm hearing you say is that um, it seems like the British colonial uh, imperialism or European uh, presence is sort of being negated by what's going on in the novel. And if that's what you're saying, then yes, that is definitely there. Although it's also uh, by bringing in uh, the Japanese occupation, which was also during that time, it's actually anti-European, but also anti uh, what the Japanese were doing. Although the novel is really interesting in complicating all of it. So there are British characters who are very sympathetic and there are Japanese characters who are also very sympathetic. And so, um, and so yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's why I'm in literary studies because I think that the world is always more compli complicated than you think. And those complications can come out in literature in ways that sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes we, we, we try to simplify when we talk and when we try to explain ourselves. And, and I love that that literature doesn't simplify. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Thanks. it does, thank you. Rosa, I hope that was uh, somewhat of a, you know, starting point for for thinking about absolutely the complications of the novel, of a novel, and also how a literary critical reading can bring those out. And in fact, the final question, which we've decided is going with the final question, which is from Munir, who's actually joining us from AMU, from Aligarh Muslim University. Um, uh, Munir is actually also asking a kind of methodological question. So, uh, Munir, would you like to ask the question yourself, or uh, because I've put I've unmute, I've put you there on the screen. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Rahman, for your wonderful talk. So uh, mine is like a beginner's question. You know, uh, this is something that uh, I've started uh, latching on to, the, the idea of uh, an archipelagic uh, thinking. And I teach this uh, wonderful novel by uh, Tayyip Saleh, a Muslim al hijrat al um, So, you know, this is something, this archipelagic reading is something that had struck me while I was teaching the novel, although I hadn't made much uh, you know, much of that uh, concept. So I was wondering if you could um, share, and also my own work is on uh, Mapula Arabic Malayalam literature from um, from South India, you know, Malabar being a piece, a piece of land, a piece of land, you know, orientated towards the sea. Uh, and the literature itself is archipelagic in, in, in some sense. Not, not an analysis that you make out of it, but the literature itself could be or Arabic Malayalam and say, as a language hybrid could itself be understood as, uh, you know, as oceanic uh, in its, uh, I mean, in all its manifestations and so on and so forth. So I was wondering for someone like me, you know, who is uh, quite new to, uh, although this, is, this has been in the air, but someone who hasn't made much of uh, this concept, um, I was wondering if you could shed more light on uh, the uh, protocols, if any, of uh, of uh, an archipelagic reading of fiction, which, which you have actually demonstrated in your talk, but I was wondering if you could shed a little more light. Uh, thank you so much. 
thank you for professor kabir also for the opportunity <laughs> thank you thank you well thank you um yeah i i guess uh the way that i do readings is i usually begin with the literature uh see what's there and then uh see if it relates to the theory that's already there um and if it doesn't if maybe there's other theory that can help shed light on what's happening in the literature and so for me it, i'm i always begin with the with my primary text uh in terms of method that that's that's where i begin and so i i noticed these things in the novel and then i went to the theory um yeah i don't that's <laughs> That's it. That's my response. <laughs> Do you want to wrap up, Luca? Well, just yes. I think yeah, we've <laughs> exhausted our time, <laughs> and um, I want to thank everybody. Well, first of all, Shazia for a wonderful talk um, today, which really. I really like the way in which, you know, what I was saying at the beginning, we really need, we feel, I feel that I need to listen to a different kind of knowledge coming from these archipelagic spaces. And I love the way you jump right into this kind of knowledge and, and languages even and concepts that otherwise, you know, often are overlooked. Uh, and then surely I knew precious little about or if anything at all. Um, uh, so thank you very much for uh, your presentation and thank for everybody for contributing with their questions. Um, we will reconvene in a couple of weeks with a different uh, seminar on a, a, a you know, slightly different uh, also disciplinary approach. We will be looking at cinema. Um, so uh, keep in touch with us uh, and uh, um, and thank you very much, everybody, for uh, taking part today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Louise, again, and Vignesh for, for kind of making this happen. Shazia for joining us and all the participants from different stages of academic life, including my undergraduates, right to our, our colleagues from the Malabar Coast who are now in AMU, and uh, colleagues from North America, from, you know, from, from closer uh, to home. It's been really wonderful to, to share this moment with all of you. And thank you, Shazia, for sharing your work with us. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you all and, um, and present. So thank you. Bye, everybody. So see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>